Dear fellow truth seekers, thank you and welcome for visiting my channel, Mytho Religio. Mytho Religio is a video channel based on a book series with the same name about religious comparison studies between the stories in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, directly from their sacred books and world mythologies, hence the name Mytho Religio. The purpose is to retrace the prehistory of humanity, since I'm not fully satisfied with either the explanations from the point of view of creationists nor evolutionists. There are so many missing links in both explanations. If you feel the same, then you are on the right channel. In this channel, I will also analyze about the prehistory of humanity from the archaeological records, modern scientific point of view, and other alternative theories such as the ancient alien theories and Atlantis or Lemuria legends. After thorough research of circa 30 years, I recognize many, many similarities between all religious stories and even mythologies, and surprisingly, some of them are in accordance or even beyond modern science that have been proven as correct. Thus, I came to the conclusion that all religions must have come from the same source. And all these religious stories and mythologies, although heavily jumbled up, are actually telling one mega story, the true prehistory of our common ancestors. This mega story is quite different than what we have been told to believe and will truly blow your mind as it is more fascinating than our imagination. If you have watched the earlier videos in this channel, I believe you can see some of the similarities too. If you haven't and you truly want to do a religious comparative study, I suggest that you do so. The best way to do a comprehensive religious study via this channel is by watching the videos starting from number one and continue until this present video and so on. That way you will see a clear pattern. In this channel, I will share almost all that I have written in my book series. However, there is one book so far that I cannot share in this channel due to its sensitive, shocking, and dark nature, and also might be considered controversial to some, but I believe it sheds more light to the above conclusion. If you want to read this around 500 pages ebook with many full color illustrations, you are more than welcome to download book number 5 entitled History of the Dark Side that is available for free in ebook format that can be found in my website www.mythorelligio.com You only have to give your email address and it will be sent to you directly. And no, I won't share your email address nor send any advertisement. The link is in the description box. If you want to get the physical book, kindly go to amazon.com. Now let's continue with this week's video. Science versus Religion Evolution from Apes to Humans Part 3 Is it possible? Dear fellow truth seekers, For the last few weeks I have shared with you the scientific theories on the origin of life, i.e. the theory of evolution and the Big Bang Theory, for our religious versus science comparison study. I did this in order to find answers to the questions that are not answered satisfactorily by religion. In the last video, I have shared with you one of the many missing links in the theory of evolution that haven't been answered by science satisfactorily, i.e. about the hominid evolution from Australopithecus, the supposed ape-like ancestors of humans, to Homo habilis, the supposed primitive men that were just able to walk upright or bipedally and able to use stone or wooden tools. Now let's continue to analyze the next stage in the hominid evolution. Homo erectus According to the theory of evolution, the internal evolution of the Homo genus is as follows. First, Homo erectus, then the so-called archaic Homo sapiens and Neanderthal man or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis and finally Cro-Magnon man or Homo sapiens sapiens. However, 
most likely all these classifications are really only variations and unique races in the human family. The difference between them is no greater than the difference between an Inuit and an African or a Pygmy and a European. It should also be noted that some of the fossils said to be Homo erectus were included under a second species named Homo ergaster by some evolutionists. There is disagreement among the experts on this issue. We will treat all these fossils under the classification of Homo erectus. Homo erectus means upright man. The above left image is a skull of Homo erectus KNMER3733. The cranial capacities of the diverse Homo erectus fossils surge between 900 to 1100 cc. These figures are within the limits of the contemporary human cranial capacity. KNMWT15000 or Turkana child skeleton shown on the right is one of the oldest and the most complete human fossils ever found. Research made on this fossil, which is said to be 1.6 million years old, shows that this belongs to a 12-year-old child who would become around 1.8 meter or circa 6 feet tall if he reached adolescence. The evolutionist Donald Johnson describes this fossil as follows. He was tall and skinny. His body shape and the proportion of his limbs were the same as the current Equator Africans. The sizes of his limbs totally matched with that of the current white North American adults. The upright skeletal structure of the fossil is no different from that of a contemporary man. American paleoanthropologist Alan Walker said that he doubted that the average pathologist could tell the difference between the fossil skeleton and that of a modern human. Concerning the skull, Walker wrote that he laughed when he saw it because it looked so much like a Neanderthal. There is no difference between the postcranial skeleton of today's man and that of Homo erectus. The primary reason for defining Homo erectus as primitive is the cranial capacity of its skull, 900 to 1100 cc, which is smaller than the average man of our day which is 1,130 until 1,500 cc, and its thick eyebrow projections. However, there are many people living today who have the same cranial capacity as Homo erectus, and other races have protruding eyebrows, like the Pygmies and Native Australians, for instance. On top of that, it is a commonly agreed upon fact that differences in cranial capacity do not necessarily denote differences in intelligence or abilities. Intelligence depends on the internal organization of the brain rather than on its volume. Marvin Lubino, Bones of Contention, Grand Rapids, Baker, 1992, page 83. The fossils that have made Homo erectus known to the entire world are those of picking men and Java man in Asia. However, in time it was realized that these two fossils are not reliable. The fossil of Peking man was unearthed in 1921 in Peking or modern-day Beijing in China. Peking man consists of some elements made of plaster whose originals have been lost. And Java man is composed of a skull fragment plus a pelvic bone that was found meters away from it with no indication that these two belong to the same creature. This is why the Homo erectus fossils found in Africa have gained such increasing importance. Even the evolutionist Richard Leakey states that the differences between Homo erectus and men of our day are no more than racial variants. One would also see differences in the shape of the skull, in the degree of protrusion of the face, the robustness of the brows, and so on. These differences are probably no more pronounced than we see today between the separate geographical races of modern humans. Such biological variation arises when populations are geographically separated from each other for significant length of time. Richard Leakey, The Making of Mankind, 
London, Sphere Books, 1981, page 116. Professor William Laughlin from the University of Connecticut made extensive anatomical examinations of Inuits and the people living on the Aleut Islands. He noticed that these people were extraordinarily similar to Homo erectus. The conclusion Laughlin arrived at was that all these distinct races were in fact different races of Homo sapiens or today's men. When we consider the vast differences that exist between remote groups such as Eskimos and Bushmen, who are known to belong to the single species of Homo sapiens, it seems justifiable to conclude that Sinanthropus, an erectus specimen, belongs within this same diverse species. Marvin Lubino, Bones of Contention, Grand Rapids, Baker, 1992, page 136. It is now a more pronounced fact in the scientific community that Homo erectus is a superfluous taxon, in other words, unnecessary biological division. Fossils assigned to the Homo erectus class are actually not so different from Homo sapiens as to be considered a different species. In American scientists, the discussions over this issue and the result of a conference held in 2000 was summarized this way. Most of the participants at the Schenkenberg Conference got drawn into a flaming debate over the taxonomic status of Homo erectus started by Milford Wolpoff of the University of Michigan, Alan Thorne of the University of Canberra and their colleagues. They argued forcefully that Homo erectus had no validity as a species and should be eliminated altogether. All members of the genus Homo from about 2 million years ago to the present were one highly variable, widely spread species Homo sapiens with no natural breaks or subdivisions. The subject of the conference Homo erectus didn't exist. Pat Shipman, Doubting Manisi, American Scientist, November to December 2000, page 491. The conclusion reached by the scientists defending the above-mentioned thesis can be summarized as Homo erectus is not a different species from Homo sapiens, but rather a race within Homo sapiens. Since most of the Homo erectus fossils do not have a common characteristic, it is quite hard to define these men according to their skulls. Thus, most likely all of them belong to particular human races. On the other hand, there is a huge gap between Homo erectus, a human race, and the apes that preceded Homo erectus in the human evolution theory, i.e. Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo rudolfensis, as explained in videos number 66 and 67. This means that the first man appeared in the fossil record suddenly and without any prior evolutionary history. Other men. In 1891, Eugene Dubois, who had dedicated himself to searching for the theory of evolution's so-called missing link, discovered a skull fragment on the shores of the River Solo on the island of Java in Indonesia. Dubois believed that this skull possessed both human and simian or ape-like properties. A year later, he discovered a thigh bone some 15 meters or 49 feet away from where he had found the top of the cranium and concluded that this thigh bone, which was very similar to those of human beings, and the skull might have belonged to the same body. Based on these two pieces of bones, he adopted the idea that this fossil might be a transitional form and gave it an impressive scientific name, Pithecanthropus erectus, or upright walking ape man. Popularly referred to as Jaffa man, the fossil had a skull volume of around 900 cc and was suggested to be around 500,000 years old, in the Pleistocene epoch in the Quaternary period. For that reason, according to Duba, the age of Java man was entirely compatible with its being the missing link. However, Dubois had prepared a study of the Javanese fossil fauna before he discovered that fossil, which study totally contradicted the information provided about Java men. But following his discovery of Java men, his comments regarding the fauna study made an abrupt about face. Marvin L. Lubino spent some 20 years researching Java men. 
In his book, Bones of Contention, he states that Dubois did not possess sufficient geological knowledge when he discovered the fossil. When Dubois issued his first description of the fossil Javanese fauna, he designated it to Pleistocene. But no sooner had he discovered his Pithecanthropus than the fauna had suddenly to become tertiary. He did everything in his power to diminish the Pleistocene character of the fauna. Dubois said that the thigh bone and the skull belonged to the same creature, yet eminent scientists of the time came to the opposite conclusion. The famous Cambridge University anatomist Sir Arthur Keith clearly stated that a skull with such a volume could not belong to an ape and revealed the absence of structural features permitting powerful mastication and particular to apes. Keith said that the skull was very definitely human. Another discovery that totally refuted Dubois ape man came from Dr. Walkhoff, an anthropologist who found the upper part of a human molar tooth in the dried up region of the river Solo, no more than three kilometers or two miles from where Dubois had discovered Java men. This fossilized molar was human and dated back to a period as old as that to which Java men supposedly belonged. A team of experts who were all evolutionists carried out this project with the aim of finding fossils to verify evolution. Nonetheless, the head of the team, Professor Selenka, concluded that modern men and Java men had lived at the same time and that there could therefore be no evolutionary relationship between Java men and modern human beings. In the final chapter of the report, Dr. Max Blankenhorn, who acted as project secretary, apologized to readers for having demolished Dubois' thesis with their discovery instead of confirming it. All this goes to show that there is no difference between Java men depicted as an ape man and modern humans. The only thing that can be suggested with regard to Java men is the small size of the skull volume, although there are races with small skulls living today. In addition, among these races are native Australians who live not so very far from the island of Java. Thus, the fact that Java man is a genuine human becomes even clearer. Homo sapiens archaic, Homo heidelbergensis, and Cro-Magnon. Homo sapiens archaic is the last step before contemporary men in the theory of evolution. In fact, there is nothing much to say about these fossils, as there are only very minor differences between them and today's human beings. Some researchers even state that representatives of this race are still living today and point to native Australians as an example. Like Homo sapiens archaic, native Australians also have thick protruding eyebrows an inward inclined mandibular structure and a slightly smaller cranial capacity. This image is of a Homo sapiens neanderthalensis and with one skull found in Israel. Neanderthal man is generally known to be robust yet short. However, it is estimated that the owner of this fossil had been 1.8 meter tall or 6 feet tall. His cranial capacity is the largest ever seen, 1740 cc. Therefore, this fossil is among the important pieces of evidence definitely destroying the claims that Neanderthals were a primitive species. The group characterizes Homo heidelbergensis in evolutionist literature is in fact the same as Homo sapiens archaic. The reason why two different terms are used to define the same human racial type is the disagreements among paleontologists. All the fossils included under the Homo heidelbergensis classification suggest that people who are anatomically very similar to today's Europeans lived 500,000 and even 740,000 years ago, first in England and then in Spain. It is estimated that Cro-Magnon man lived 30,000 years ago. He had a dome-shaped cranium and a broad forehead. His cranium of 1,600 cc is above the average for contemporary men. His skull has thick eyebrow projections 
and a bony protrusion at the back that is characteristic of both Neanderthal man and Homo erectus. Although the Cro-Magnon is considered to be a European race, the structure and volume of Cro-Magnon's cranium look very much like those of some races living in Africa and the tropics today. Relying on this similarity, it is estimated that Cro-Magnon was an archaic African race. Some other paleoanthropological finds have shown that the Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthal races intermix and laid the foundations for the races of our day. As a result, none of these human beings were primitive species. They were different human beings who lived in earlier times and either assimilated and mixed with other races, or became extinct and disappeared from history. Most of the evolution pictures that we see today are artists' interpretation of how they think primitive people should look like. How do we know exactly how a person looked like in reality when we only have the skulls? Can you tell the difference between the Cro-Magnon on the left image and the modern Yanomano people on the Amazon on the right one? So why is the evolution theory presented as a fact when there are so many unanswered questions and so many missing links in this theory? We have yet to find one single intermediary form between species from water to land animals, from land to flying animals, and from apes to humans. I don't know what you think, but I'm getting a little frustrated finding out about all the unsatisfactory information that I have shared with you about the hominid evolution, starting from video number 66 until this video number 68. And I guess I'm not the only one. Apparently, some evolutionists too feel frustrated that they had to create hoaxes proof. For example, Nebraska man, bone wars, Archaeoraptor and Recapitulation Theory. You can check them easily on the internet. But this video is getting too long as it is. Next week, I will share with you one of the biggest hoaxes in the scientific world in an attempt to prove the validity of the hominid evolution. For now, allow me to thank you for watching and hope to see you next week.